Hello there. Uh, I'm going to show you how I made uh, this illustration. Uh, here it is. It's a picture of my hometown, Thrall, New South Wales. Uh, let me let me give you a bit of a bit of a closer look. We've got some beautiful mountains in the background. We've got some uh, playground, uh, a playground. We've got a pool. Kids playing in the pool. The wall in front of the pool, very important piece of architecture in my hometown. And the, um, the boardwalk, the public meeting space, the Greek forum of, uh, of, of coastal New South Wales, and, uh, and, 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 the, you know, and, the, and the sand. Um, I'm gonna show you um, how I went from a blank piece of paper to uh, a, a printed artifact. And, uh, and I should say, this is a print project. It's not, I'm not thinking about digital illustration as, a, as something I'm making for screens. I'm thinking about it as something that I'm making for print, something like this thing up here. So I'll take you through the workflow really quickly. Um, I'll first begin with, um, uh, what I call research, design research, visual research, but in my case it's observation and, and, and sort of field work. Um, and then I do some a little bit of uh, dreaming, fermentation I call it, um, and, then, uh, and then I do some sketches on an iPad and a sketchbook, and then I do some pencils on a piece of grid paper, then I, do, I, create, I create my line work assets on a nice piece of uh, drawing paper with graphite, uh, and then I get it into Photoshop and do some color blocking, um, and then I do some more sketching of mostly of the details and features um, and then some more line work composite that all together in, in, in scan and composite that line work all together in Photoshop and then um, do the final digital coloring and at the end of the process you end up with a nice print on the wall. So the first thing I want to cover is research and fermentation developing an idea. The genesis of this idea comes from Observation. I'm down at the beach, I'm on my bike, and I see humans. I like to look at humans. Um, and particularly, I like, to, I, like, I like to look at humans when they're, they're, they're having calm, gentle, quiet moments. Uh, that's the kind of the, the, the direction of my creative practice at the moment. Um, and so I had this idea of, of doing a, a portrait of my hometown, of this, um, of this piece of kind of ignoble architecture, which is like the... Um, the kind of the, the toilet block. It's a toilet block, um, uh, you know, with with a lot of ugly concrete that's uh, near the beach at, at my house. There's something that I've always loved about this piece of architecture, and the way the piece of architecture makes people feel safe and encourages them to interact and build community. Um, so I did I, I did a I did a, an illustration of based on this um, this um, this toilet block uh, in my hometown. And uh, this was another another thing designed for print, and um, and my and the people in my hometown really loved it. And I think I kind of stumbled on something that they haven't quite seen in an illustration before. And so once you're going to commit to an idea like that, it's 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 kind of useful to think, um, what what am, what is this? Why is this valuable? Why am I actually um, making these creative decisions? And why are they connecting with people? And so I kind of realized pretty quickly that what I was doing fit into this genre that we would, that I would call like tourist kitsch. So here's an example. Um, I remember being a kid, I'd, I'd go visit someone's house and I, I would always be drawn to this sort of like illustration that, that on the wall that was almost like evidence that there were sophisticated cultured people and they could afford a plane ticket and they'd been on a holiday. But there's this kind of tradition of illustration. It's kind of like it's a, it's a landscape illustration. It's um it's 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 it's, a, it's minimal. It's informed by Art Deco, Art Nouveau, mid-century kind of modernism. Um, but it's uh but it's but it's still illustrative. It's still got graphic pop, and it's and it, you know quite quite a beautiful tradition of illustration. And so I thought, okay, that's I love that. Great. Um, so let me dig deeper into it and. Uh, and of course, there's a there's a there's a there's a much more grotesque Australian version of the thing, and um and as you would expect, the Australian version of it focuses on our beautiful beaches. And I'm looking at these, and I'm thinking, <laughs> what I what I'm interested in doing is actually turning the camera 
around away from this iconic crescent shaped beach and, and turning it on this ugly toilet block. Okay, here are a few examples um, that are a bit more contemporary. Uh, this one here uh, is, uh, this one in the middle here, is a picture of my hometown, a sort of like painting of, of, of my hometown. Um, but well, I guess what it's missing is like community. Like it's like this sort of thing that landscapes do where they sort of avoid people. It's like, a, you know, this one on the right, a uh, little bit, little bit beer commercially. Um, I, I don't mind it. Um, and this one on the left here, this is a David Pope illustration, which I, and David Pope is an artist who I admire very much. Um, I really love, I really love how he's chosen a, a kind of a really like a quotidian or kind of ignoble or um, way of looking at this this uh, Australian um, small town. Um, I guess I would be diver diver diverging from this in that I'm, uh, this is a little bit too photo reference, a little bit too hyper real for me. Um, and I'm kind of much more interested in going off into the, uh, further down the plane towards abstraction into warped perspectives and more kind of, um, more kind of abstracted cartoony, cartoony images. Okay. And lastly, I'll just um, show you some of my reference photos. So this is the place. Cerule, New South Wales. Look at oop. There's lots of ugly concrete. There's lots of uh, sort of quite. There's you know lots of uh, geometric shapes. The uh, Norfolk Island pines, iconic um, iconic tree, and of course we've got we've got the beautiful beach. Uh, this is the playground. This to me is the community. The, 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 this and the boardwalk are the two kind of community zones. Where I, where I feel like um, people are interacting in a way that, that's really rich and meaningful. Um, so I took these photos mainly as a kind of color reference. But there's another kind of photo which is actually a pretty important part of the research is this one here. And this photo has actually a lot of what the illustration has in it. Um, it's got this uh, the mountain in the background. We've got the, uh, we've got the, the, the sun shining on like Dapto, I guess. The, the, the Dapto Hills and in the front we've got some Berkeley like low-income housing from Berkeley which is another beautiful another subject close to my heart and uh, and and you know like suburban lawns mailboxes um, concrete driveways um, that kind of stuff that, that kind of suburban stuff which is the very much the you know the subject of, of, of a huge amount of Australian illustration and printmaking so now, now, at some point, it's time to put pen to paper and, um, and start sketching this illustration. So the first version of this illustration that I drew was actually um, in an iPad, on an iPad. Um, I don't actually work that often on an iPad, but uh, this is one time I was stuck in a lecture with that particular tool, and, uh, and that's what I came up with. But uh, I also spent some time iterating on the composition itself uh, here in my... Uh, in my sketchbook. So all the prep's done now. Now it's time to get the drawing gear out and, and, and get started. So uh, as far as the workflow goes, this, this section uh, is what I call pencils or penciling. Uh, that, that just comes from comics. So before I show you what the pencils look like, I just want to talk for a second about um, this principle, this drawing principle called layering. This is something I stumbled upon by accident, but, but in over the years, I've noticed that everyone who's a, who's a great drafts person uses some form of layering in their drawing. Um, so here's an example. Uh, okay, so say like in this instance, I, I, I do the, the planning drawing on these big pieces of grid paper. Um, when I begin to draw, I'll begin to draw with a green pencil. And then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, at some point, it will become busy and difficult and confused. And that's when I stop and, and create a new conceptual layer. And I'll, I'll signify that with a different pen. So I'll, I'll get a red, a red colored pencil in, in, in this instance. And so I might go through five or six different tools, building different layers of colored pencil, tr usually changing when, I'm, when, when the drawing in front of me is confusing me. And so I change the tool to try and, to try and interrupt that confusion. 
Um, and then when I'm really confident, I'll, I'll probably get a get one of these uh, Artline felt tip pens and start and start doing something that 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 sort of uh, is a, is a little bit like what the line work is going to look like. So this is all planning document. It's all problem solving. I try and do all my problem solving on this disposable grid paper. And uh, and I often I'll sit I'll get a, a piece a nice piece of a nice thick lead pencil and I'll do some shading um, as a way of planning where I think the the darks and lights and the different values are going to be in the future. So when these when these pencils are done, it'll look uh, something like this in the end. Um, and so if you get if you get a bit of a closer look, you can see there's sort of sort of lots of scribbling, lots of loose drawing, but really what I'm trying to do is, um, is, is solve problems and try, and try and clarify exactly, exactly what it is I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about things like, like shape language and, uh, and composition and, um, and perspective and all of those kind of like concerns that you have at the, at the beginning of your, of your illustration process. Um, okay, so that's the, the document itself, but I, I kind of wanted to show you um, what I did with that document. So I think about, uh, I use a light box to kind of uh, facilitate this la layering process. Um, a light box is a, a relatively lo-fi cheap piece of equipment that you can probably get your hands on. I know people who have made them out of like glass tables with a, with a torch. Um, and so I put this, uh, this, this grid paper document that, I, that I've made on top of that and then I create my sort of final assets by, um, by, by creating sort of layers of nicer paper on top of that using the light box. So that's kind of how I'm thinking, that's how I'm sort of conceptualizing the, the drawing part of this illustration process. Okay, at some point you've, you feel like you've done enough planning and it's time to, st time to start on the line work phase of, of the illustration. I, I, I would, I'm, I'm starting with my, my planning document on grid paper. I'm putting that on top of a light box and I'm drawing uh, on top of it. I'm, I'm, I'm tracing the, the lines with a um, nice piece of uh, uh, drawing paper with a kind of cream tint to it and, and one of these um, big, big soft lead pencils. And I'm actually doing it really quite quickly. I like to have a loose line that is is actually very planned, but uh, but feels like it's kind of spontaneous and alive. And and I feel like these tools and this process kind of allows me that the freedom of planning, but also getting a nice a nice friendly loose line. It's actually an incredibly satisfying part of the process. So what we're, what I'm working towards here is a Photoshop document that looks something like this. So my my line work assets get sort of scanned with an A4 scanner and assembled. And I'm, I'm really, really being careful to make sure they all have the same kind of feel, like they, were, they feel like they were all drawn on the same piece of paper. Um, and in, in, in many ways they were, and that's kind of why I work like this. This is, this is uh, what the drawings themselves actually look like. There's literally not enough room on the, on the screen for, for, for you to see. And so that kind of brings me to a really, really important subject that I, be, that, that I think about all the time, but I've never actually had a chance to articulate properly. So here's one of the things that I do in my practice. Um, I, I try and keep a, a fixed scale to all of my drawings within, it, within a single illustration. And what does that mean? It means at the beginning I decide on, on, on how big I imagine my final print will be. In this case, about like 800 uh, millimeters by 420 millimeters. And, um, and I, when I'm doing my sketches, I draw at exactly that size. I, 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 cut, I, I assemble and cut out pieces of paper to, to, to fit that size. And when I'm doing more sketches, I, I, I try and keep all the sketches at the same size. Um, and, and, and I trace on top of that onto pieces of paper that are at the same scale too. So all of, the, all of these working documents are, are, are literally the same size as the print. And then, um, and then I even scan a piece of blank paper at, at, at exactly the same sort of resolution as all my other scans so that I've got a piece of, a, a, some paper texture to work with as well. And so what I'm, what I'm trying to work towards is a print that feels like you're, you're holding the re the original drawing and and that's kind of like a, like something that I value in prints and something that I'm trying to 
I'm trying to instill in this particular illustration using, using this kind of workflow. That's not how you have to work. That's not how everybody should work. That's just how I, partic I like to work for this particular project. But scale, the scale of your, uh, your drawings or your original assets are really important when we're working in like a uh, digital material hybrid process like I'm using here. Okay, so most people, if they're scanning their drawings, will be, will be doing some kind of scaling up or, or scaling down. And I just want to talk for a second about what, what that actually means. If, we're, if, you, if you make large drawings and then you scan them and scale them down for, for print or reproduction, what you get is a kind of graphic control. You know, the, the words we would describe, um, the, 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 the things that will happen to your drawing is they'll become tight, they'll become deliberate, they'll become intricate. That's because all the limitations of your moving body are kind of compressed into a, into a smaller space. Now, if you want to do the opposite and make really small drawings and then like blow them up for print, what that gives is, is a kind of a graphic power. Um, you, you, you have raw expressive lines and you can't actually fit enough into the, this tiny drawing that you're starting with um, to, have, to have intricate detail. And so instead you end up with a kind of really a powerful minimalism. Um, but I think the most important thing is to plan this in advance, be really aware of it, and, and, and above all, be consistent about what you're doing when you're doing this. Okay, I want, to, I want to try and describe a situation that always seems to get me in trouble. When I'm working this way that I'm working, where I'm, I'm, I'm creating these sort of separate assets to put together in Photoshop. Okay, let's say, hypothetically speaking, you have... Uh, you want, you want to do a, an illustration and you decide you want to draw everything separately. So you, you, you draw like this cool picture of a skater or whatever. Or maybe a not cool picture of a skater. I don't know. And you're like, cool. And you do that on a, on a big piece of A3 printer paper. And, uh, and, all, and so you draw, on, on a separate day, you draw a layout, like a, like a, like a background. And you do that on a, on a piece of sort of um, textured uh, butcher's paper. And then you, or you're on the train on your sketchbook and you, um, and you see somebody skateboard and you're like, oh, that's right. And you've got a reference, so you draw a skateboard in, in your sketchbook. What if you decide you want to put all these assets together into a single illustration? So let's say you've got your, rant, your, 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 your background. I might just zoom in a bit here. Let's say you've got your, your background and you, okay, cool. So you, you, your background, because it's drawn, you know, like relatively small, you might want to blow that up. Okay, cool. I know I generally try not to blow things up, but, but sometimes that happens. Okay, and then you have your, your, your skater character and um, of course, obviously that's huge. So um, you, might, you, you might want to sort of, I don't know, shrink that down or, or, or something like that. Um, cool. Okay, there we go. We've got that, and then you've got your skateboard, um, which you're, you know, we're bringing down there too. Hang on, and we're 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 spinning that that around. Okay, so so this is kind of what 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 I'm trying to avoid. I'll get my I'll get my eraser out and just. Uh, um, get rid of that for now. Um, this is kind of what I, what the, the situation that I'm trying to avoid, and the situation is, you've got, you've used this even though even though you you might have used the same pen to draw these drawings, when you assemble them together, you've got all these whack line weights and. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and you've got some lines that are textured from different paper and some lines that are, that are, that are textured from smooth paper. And, um, and, and it just looks a bit weird. It looks a bit digital. It, it make, it, it, what it does is it, is it, is it makes people, uh, it, it adds a layer of inauthenticity or, um, um, to, to, to the illustration. I try and avoid this. Um, and so that's the reason I draw everything at a fixed scale. So everything, everything is done with the same materials on the same paper at the same scale. And that's the way to try and avoid that kind of, that kind of whack, the, the kind of whack digital look. 
just by way of example, I might actually show you some of this whackness in my um, in in my finished illustration because there because there there are su there are one or two moments where the, this asset thinking um, didn't didn't really work for me, and I think these cockies here. Yeah, let's zoom in a bit. So can you see with these cockies how it's kind of like, it's like, it's pretty obvious if you look really carefully that these, that, that these lines weren't drawn at the same, in the same drawing act. They were like, they were, it was kind of, there, there's, some, there's some digital sort of uh, alchemy going on here. Um, this is a, a, something that sort of stands out to me. The further back you look, the, the less of it's an issue, but um, this is an example of the kind of whackness that, that, that I'm trying to avoid with, with, with this sort of fastidiousness about scale. It doesn't always work. So if you're going to work like this with, um, by, by creating assets and bringing them together in Photoshop, this can be what, what I call the, the, the danger of, of asset thinking. Um, um, and there are a few things that I think you, could, you can monitor when you're working like this that can be, that can be really, really helpful, Re little alarm bells that, that go along. So the first thing is like line density or line weight. Like, like if you're having if 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 your lines are coming in at different weights and density, then you really want to be in control of that. You want to be you you don't want that to be happening incidentally as part of your your process. Um, uh, consistency of texture. So if you're if you're if you're taking a big textured asset and shrinking it down. And a small textured asset and blowing it up, and and those are together in the same image. You're gonna get uh, this sort of weird feeling that like the texture in the illustration is inauthentic. Um, and the other thing is, um, this is like a hippie fruity pat thing, but like I call it the voice of the line. Um, a line is like a is like a line has has a voice. It has personality. It has flavor. And and for me. That flavor comes from materials and movement. And so if you're using uh, certain kind of materials and making big, big, broad movements, it's going to be a different voice, a different flavor to something that's a little scratchy fine movement. So the, draw, the size of the drawing you make actually matters a lot. The next stage for me is to start uh, incorporating some color into the illustration. Um, the reason, one of the reasons I do this at this point is because color is terrifying and hard and I don't want to leave it to the last day when we might be getting close to deadline. So um, I, I use a process that I call color blocking. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so I've done a quick scan of our assets. It doesn't have to be the final scan, but you know, um, just enough to get it into Photoshop to start experimenting. And color blocking to me is 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 literally just just blocking out um, um, big areas of color. I think if you can get color and value blocking done on your illustration early, then really really half of the work is done. Now, let's see what what color blocking looks like. Um, I what I do is I try and work fast and I try and I, I try and start from color research and do many many as many different options as I can in a short amount of time. Um, so th this is this is uh, kind of where I started, based on the sketch that I'd done on my iPad, um, and then I kind of went off in other directions. Um, when I get tired or stuck, I'll go look at look at some 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 other images or so, some other some other color examples on on Pinterest or something like that. Um, and this is the crazy place. This is not a happy good place. This is like. I, 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 this is where you really lose sense of whether or not you you have any talent or, or or sound judgment at all. But I just try to keep try to keep doing it, and I try to take a screenshot every two or three minutes, um, and I keep all these screenshots um, handy so that I can review them later. Um, and so what what I did in this instance was I uh, oops. What I did in this instance was I. Um, I printed them out and I showed them to people and, and my son had opinions and my partner had opinions um, and then uh, and there's lots of agonizing and lots of wondering and you ne you, I never feel like I know what I know what the answer is and then I finally get to the point where I'm just like ah it's this one so I kind of settled on this one on the left and so I, I mocked up a, a quick palette on which is this uh, sort of image on the right 
and that's kind of my working palette for the for the rest of the illustration process we've got the basic kind of blocks of color down we've got the line work in Photoshop um, but there's massive amounts of detail missing. There's no humans. There's that, you know, like, like there's a lot missing from this illustration. It's time to go back to the, um, back to the drawing process. So there's a second round of pencils on grid paper and a second round of line work assets on another sheet of that cream paper. Here's what the, the, the sketches look like. And here's what the, the, the traces that I made over the top of them look like. And so again, that gets scanned and, and brought into Photoshop. And we find ourselves in, in, in a position like this where we can start to populate the, um, the, the drawing with these, uh, with these, with these sort of uh, ghostly black and white humans. So this is the uh, assembly part of the workflow. And I won't go into this in too much detail, but there's quite a bit of um, mucking around to try and get the uh, all the line work to to sort of to sort of integrate nicely. But I, I but I do try and keep to the rules that I set for myself. Not not too much uh, sh resizing of things. But there's like hours of sort of nudging and and adjusting the the the, the line work using the levels tool and the curves tool. And, uh, and different um, o different um, layer effects to try to try and get 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 it all to, to sit right together. But what you're aiming for in the end is something like this, like a like like a really really clearly defined um, set set of line work assets that you can that 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 that, that you can sort of like that they're really easily to manipulate and you can you can adjust the composition and and, and nudge things around um, and then um, and then it's time for the kind of like re rewarding work which is um which is which is the coloring and bring bring it bringing the illustration together using using all the digital tools at at, at our disposal before we go on to the final stage of the workflow, I just wanted to introduce another kind of big idea that is sort of guides my practice, and that is the idea of uh, limitations. Creating limitations for yourself when you're working in a digital space with digital tools. This is Photoshop. Photoshop is a pit bull. And what happens when you, when you have a pit bull that doesn't have any sense of boundaries? People get hurt. Children get their arms twisted off, grown-ups get mauled, small birds get digested. I like to think of digital tools as most useful when there is some kind of limitation applied to them. And so when I'm designing a workflow, when I'm thinking about how I'm going to get this illustration from an idea into a, into a finished print, I'm, I'm, I'm creating really, really clear boundaries and limitations for what I, what I will and will not do with Photoshop. So here are some examples. Um, all lines must be drawn with, with the same pencil. Uh, all lines must be drawn on the same paper stock. All drawings will be made at, at actual size. All block color comes from, pal from, from, from the palette. All detail color is made in reference to the block color. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. Wherever possible, all detail color should be reused. And the digital brush setting should remain fixed as often as possible. So I'm not changing, resizing the brush or changing the settings too much. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping that consistent. Every project, every project has different limitations, but it really helps me stay sane when I'm, when I'm using digital tools by creating artificial boundaries and, and fake fences that, that rein in what I'm doing with this kind of limitless uh, piece of software. We now arrive at the final step of the uh, workflow, which is the, which is done entirely in the in, in, in the digital space in Photoshop, and that's sort of di the, the digital coloring and and, and, cr and really just taking everything we everything we've gathered and collected and all the decisions we've made and assembling it into a print ready file. Okay, this is what our file looks like. We've got our, our line work kind of isolated onto uh, three separate layers. 
We've got our mountains. We've got our uh, humans. I'm called. I call the layer humans, and we've got our uh, our structure, or you know, like the the layout itself, the kind of uh, the the, tr the 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 original kind of drawing, the main composition. So the first job is to refer back to the color decision making that we've done done maybe days or weeks earlier, and block out the color and with a, with with a bit of precision. So as you can see, there's like, you know. Um, just a big lump of yellow, a big lump of grey, um, a big lump of, uh, of, of, of cream, or what, what is that, a peachy colour. Um, and then there's, quite a, there's, there's actually quite a bit of detail in this background area where we've got the, um, where we've got the, uh, the, the buildings and, and the trees. I'm particularly fond of these yellow cabbage tree palms. Um, okay, and so, I mean, that's probably three or four hours work just there. Um, and then um, we're kind of going in and we've got these humans on a separate layer. And I'm kind of going in with a digital brush, which I've kind of, I've kind of, I'm using a, a, a graphite brush and, and I've, I've made the settings as close as I can to the graphite lines that I've done, I've drawn in the material space, so that there's there's a kind of uh, there's there's a kind of visual echo between the the texture that I'm getting from the digital brush and the um and the and the graphite that I've that I've scanned. And so here's a pro here's a sort of example of that. You can see, you can kind of tell if you know what you're looking for. You can tell what's what's a digital line and what's a what's a, an actual graphite line but there's a but but if you're not really looking that closely they kind of they integrate they integrate reasonably well okay and so pretty much the 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 lion's share of the work this day is going through and I'm um, coloring in these humans and so remember I said that uh, what I like to do is to borrow all of the detail color from the block color so really I'm, I'm using the eyedropper and I'm kind of going and I'm, and I'm making decisions about like what every little colored, what color every little area is. But mostly what I'm doing is, is picking up color from different sections. So for example, this yellow that this car has done and this surfboard and this football and this, uh, this high vis um, is collected from the yellow block down here at the bottom of the drawing. Um, and, and occasionally I'll, I'll, I'll adjust those colors here and there, but, but, but I really try not to. Um, and so wherever possible, I try to reuse the colors that are already in the document. And, and, and so that, what that does is, is it actually creates a kind of balance. So you have details up in this pink section, which are balancing out the block shape down in the yellow section and vice versa. You've got some details of pink and purple in the, in the yellow, which are balancing out the, the, the big block of pink and purple up in the top of the drawing. And so um, I think you can, you, if you're kind of constantly going over here to the, to the color palette section or, or worse to the sort of swatches section, what you find is you get yourself into trouble. You, 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 you should, at, at some point, I try not to be introducing any new color information in, into the illustration, just to be using what, what I've got and sort of, and maybe, maybe adjusting things here and there. So these humans are kind of done in, in, in flat color. Um, and uh, now I'll show you this pool section, which um, really, when I did the pool section, it really made the drawing kind of come back together. So I'll hide the humans um, and I'll just show you what, what I had, what we had sort of as far as our original line work. Um, and, and then And then I kind of added, uh, I, had, I, I, I had these sort of pool assets that I, that I drawn on, on the large paper. And so we've got this, um, this uh, grid, grid line with, you know, the tiles at the bottom of the pool. Um, we've got the, uh, the, the wall shadow behind them. And we've got the, um, the, the, the shadows of the humans um, that are sort of floating in the water. Something that I stole from Chris Ware, actually. And then the little dots of color, which again are sort of balancing out against some other blocks of color that are elsewhere in the illustration. Um, okay, so I'm, I, I, 
I didn't know that this illustrate that this illustration was really going to work until this kind of all came together at the end, and I, I was I was really happily surprised at how this pool came out. I, I kind of like how weird weirdly they're sort of they look like they're floating in in blue space. Uh, okay, um, okay, so probably four hours work of. Uh, um, of, of kind of going through and, and coloring in all the all, all these people um, and then um, and then it's kind of there's a, there's another sort of hour or two's work in, in in adding some shadow so this is one of those examples of really clear limitations so what I'm trying to avoid is an an image that is overly complex and and hard on the eye an image that creates eyeball labor by having lots of gradients and lots of like um, lo like like this kind of overworked um, use of play of light, uh, so I'm going to turn the humans off and just show you what the shadow looks like without without the humans. So what it is, this shadow layer, there it is. There I, I, you can probably get a good sense of it now. So the, all this all this um, all this shadow information is on a, a separate layer, and it's just one color. It's a, it's about a fifty percent gray with it with a hint of brown. Um, so, and I'll show you what that looks like. And so, I, what I did is I I don't didn't really think too hard about what what color to use for this shadow, but um, but I, I just used the I just set it to multiply and use the opacity. Uh, slider to decide how how dark to go with it um, and it's all done on one layer with one digital brush with with the digital brush settings fixed and um, and it's and it's only one color so there's really like there's re I really set really clear boundaries on on how I'm going to in incorporate the play of light into this illustration um, Again, I'm not saying you know, you should work like that. What I'm saying is that like this is a this is a technique that I use to stay sane. So, I actually learned this from working with watercolor. I I, I did a graphic novel where I it, where each of the pages had a I did a pass with just a sepia wash, and it was such a great fast, uh, loose way to to incorporate some 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 depth and light light thinking into the into each page of comics okay let's have a look so that's the that's the shadow with the opacity set to 100 i'm just going to drop that down to about 50 which was the um the setting that that, that i kind of decided on and i'll show you what that looks like with the block color and then with the humans and then with the humans color so i'll just toggle the shadow on and off again so so you, you guys can see what what I mean, what 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 effect it actually does. Maybe on this um these people down here. Um, so I'll toggle the shadow on and off. Subtle, but um, it does make a does make a bit of a difference. Okay. And now um, I'll show you what I did with with some of the assets I I had drawn in my and, and I had in mind that I was going to reverse them out. I was going to make them uh, appear as, as light areas in the illustration. There's not a lot of white in this illustration, um, and I like to use white strategically. I, I like to use my um, my area of zero value um, as as a, as an attention getting device. So here's the white stuff up here. Uh, let's have a look at it. So you've got um, actually you've got um, that fence, this fence here. So that's just, that's the same graphite asset. It's just treated differently in um, in Photoshop. And the filter, the layer filter that I've used is called Pass Through. I don't don't know anything <laughs> much much about that. I just that's just the I just found a way to make it work. <laughs> Uh, and here's our, uh, our, our, our main uh, type asset. Uh, and then up the top, we've got uh, some clouds. 
And then, um, where else is it? Oh, this, this hill hoist here. This is a bit fussy, really. Probably wouldn't do that again if I had a choice. I probably would have just got rid of it. Okay. So that's the, those, those, are, those are the white elements. Um, and what else have I got to show you guys? Oh, there's a few little details like this, uh, the, the graffiti on the walls. Um, and, oh, and finally the, the gradients here. So there's a gradient in the sky and there's a gradient in the, um, in the ground here. I do use a gradient occasionally, although I, I've got to say it is the most dangerous tool. <laughs> oh man, overusing gradients will kill any illustration. Um, okay, and the last thing I wanted to show you guys was the paper texture. So I scanned, I'll turn everything off so you can see this. I scanned the, paper, the, the, the drawing paper that I bought from the art supply store that I did all my drawings, uh, drawings on, that big yellow, yellow paper. And I mean, this is what it looks like. You know, from a distance, it just looks like a kind of creamy colored square. But if you want to really like zoom in, um, you can see there is a, there is a texture to this, this paper. Um, let me just... I'll put the contrast up so you can cut. Oh, that doesn't actually do anything. There you go. Put the contrast up so you can actually see what the what the texture looks like. Um, and this is something I do. It's actually quite difficult to scan a, a piece of blank paper. So um, I, I found through trial and error that. Um, I had to actually make some marks on it. I had to do like some little cr crosses on, on the white paper and then sort of um, magic, what's it not? It's not magic wand, it's a uh, clone stamp them, them out. Clone stamp's kind of useful for, for like these sort of subtle textures. Um, but what I didn't do was scan a A4 piece of paper and blow it up to the, the print size. Instead I scanned a huge piece of paper and assembled it. Um, I, I scanned a huge piece, piece of paper, like 16 scans on my A4 scanner, and then assembled that. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's that, that, that consistency of scale, trying to keep the, the grain of the paper um, matching the grain of the, 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 the graphite and, and kind of in keeping with the grain of the digital brush. So let's see what that looks like when we incorporate it into the illustration white stuff, we've got the mountain lines, the humans, the graffiti, the shadows, the humans color, and the final line work. And what else did I, oh, and the pools, the pool lines, cool. Um, okay, so I'll zoom in a bit, I guess. Um, so I'm just gonna toggle, turn the, the, the paper texture on and off, really subtle. Um, one of the, the effects that, that and, and that paper texture is at the, on, at, on the top of the document, so, and it's set to multiply, so every pixel in the, um, in, in the stack gets, gets sort of filtered through this, uh, this, this paper texture. And, uh, and I, think, I think it's a nice little technique to bring the whole illustration together to make it feel like it was, um, to make it feel like it's one integrated drawing. Um, and if I was printing on colored paper, I might not do this because I would let the, 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 the co colored paper um, present, do, do, do the same thing. And if you're pr printing on textured paper, I would almost certainly not do this because what you don't want is um, to be printing a paper texture onto a, a, a printer paper that already has texture. That's whack. That's, that, that, that looks weird and fake to me. So I try and avoid that. Um, but the, the, the prints that I'm making, it's, it's a relative, it's, it's an uncoated paper. Um, so, uh, so a little bit of texture, um, works okay. Um, all right, that's it guys. That is the, that is the Photoshop stack. Um, and this is, uh, ready to go.
Um, and so the final export is I'm doing an export as um, as as a as as a full size, which is which is 600 DPI. So I could potentially blow this image up if I needed to. Um, I'll set it at print size, which is 300 DPI, um, and that's the one that I'll send to the printer. Um, and then I'll do some um, ones of like I think a thousand pixels. 2000 pixels that are that are more more suitable for sort of sending around the web um, and showing showing on the web Can I show you some of the things that I like about it? big fan of this guy Port Kembla wharf worker Taking his taking his little kid for a stroll love a love a man in high vis with a pram um, most of the, you know, like, like not most, but like a lot of the people in here are real people who I have either observed or who I, I know personally. Um, uh, here's Chris and Dave. What up, Chris and Dave? Miss you guys. Um, here's my family uh, on, on, our, uh, on our ridiculous middle-class electric bike. Um, and here is me. This is, this is me. <laughs> There's a story behind this little this little little Easter egg, which was uh, about a little bit over a year ago in the, in the the first COVID lockdown. Um, some some activists and I uh, painted this mural in the middle of the night, uh, which is on the wall <laughs> in front of the pool. Um, it's like a climate change thing. We just want it. We needed to do something. We're all in lockdown and going crazy. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> we got caught by the cops. <laughs> we, we, we're so hopeless at being naughty that we got caught by the cops. And we got caught by the cops because we, we saw them. I was drawing the last line on, on the eye, on the, the, <laughs> the, the character's eye. And, um, and we saw the cops coming and we were like, oh. I guess we're environment activists. We we should probably clean up. And because we took twenty minutes to clean up, we got we got caught. Um, and so we didn't get a chance to rub the chalk out. So you can see that the chalk outlines of the of the grid we used to plan the document. Um, but uh, um, so I got in trouble for that. I I actually got charged. I have to go to court in a couple of weeks. Um, and so for me, this this wall is 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 really charged. It's really like a it's really it's really an important place to me that I'll, I'll I'll kind of never forget. So this section here is is a little nod to that uh that 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 time in our lives. And that's the end of the video. Uh, if you're interested in prints, you can pick them up at Burning Palms Gallery in Wollongong. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Bye.